Well, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of Feed the Future, uh, USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and the Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation, I welcome you to our webinar, Balancing Market Approaches to Better Youth Employment Outcomes. This is our capstone event for the Youth Employment Theme Month that we've been jointly hosting between AgriLinks and MarketLinks. I am your host and friendly neighborhood strategy and learning advisor, Zachary Bakke, with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I will moderate today's webinar. Before we dive into the content, let us take a moment to go over a few items to orient you to the Blue Jeans webinar platform. On the right side of your screen, you will see where most of your controls are located. First, please do use the chat to introduce yourself, uh, share resources, and to connect and network with your colleagues from around the globe. This is a great opportunity to, to do so, so please take advantage. Use of the Q&A button. Use the Q&A button to post your questions. Please indicate for whom your question is. This will help us uh, in sorting out questions during the Q&A. If you see a question you want to hear answered or one that is the same as yours, you can upvote it with the thumbs up icon. You can ask questions in the Q&A throughout the webinar, an easy way to kind of capture your thoughts in the moment um, instead of having to wait till the end. We will have our Q&A session after the presenters have spoken. In case you find the presentation, the screen, too small, you can increase the size of it by using the slider bar underneath the image. Take a moment to adjust the view to suit you. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will enable it will email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once we have them ready. We will also post these resources on AgriLinks and MarketLinks. Thank you for your attention. Now onwards to our presentations and discussions for today's webinar, Balancing Market Approaches to Better Youth Employment Outcomes. I am pleased to introduce our speakers for this webinar. Starting off, Dr. Bernard Muller is an employment specialist in the International Labor Organization's Decent Work Team for Eastern and Southern Africa. In this role, he is responsible for providing technical guidance and support to the organization's members and constituents with regard to designing and implementing employment creation policies and initiatives. He has over 10 years of experience as de a development practitioner, policy advisor, researcher, university teacher, and consultant with a specialist focus on labor markets and employment in Sub-Saharan Africa. Our next speaker would be Ulama Traub, is a value chain and policy analyst. Her research interests include uh, outreach and capacity building programs in collaboration with African-based agricultural policy think tanks, focusing on regional staple food marketing and trade policies and their effects on sustainable and equitable development. He serves as the chair of the technical committee for the Regional Network of Agricultural Policy Research Institutes, which is an African-led, African-driven, regionally coordinated group of national agricultural policy research institute. And also Tracy Kamathi is the founder of Berardi. Uh, since 2018, she has been gradually setting up an early stage footprint in the decentralized African energy and livestock sector through developing and owning commercial micro projects. With that, I will hand it off to Dr. Bernard Muller to start us off. All right, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Zachary, for that kind introduction and, and hello to everyone out there. Uh, greetings from South Africa, where I'm based. So here this afternoon, good morning to others elsewhere, or good evening. Um, I'm trying to give you a bit of a rundown on, on some of these topics that we're talking about. As you, as you know, uh, when you only signed up for this, the main topic is about employment promotion and whether we should focus on demand or supply side intervention. And, and, and that already is, I think, quite a technical question in many ways. So I wanted to try and break that down a little bit before I give you my answer, maybe. So uh, next slide, please. Yes, thanks. Um, 
first of all, we need to look a little bit at the, the terminology and, and what we're actually talking about here. So, and I wanted to do that by starting with a quick poll. So, uh, next slide, please, Shontis. There we are. Because maybe we're not all talking about the same things when we're thinking about demand and supply side input, or we're not thinking about exactly the same. So I wanted to do a quick quiz. Uh, there should be a poll showing up. You see it on your right hand side there. Uh, and the question is this, which one of these is a demand side intervention? One, skills development and technical and vocational education and training. Access to finance, micro grants to micro, small and medium enterprises. Three, elimination of child labor, four, entrepreneurship development, five, provision of old age pensions, six, apprenticeships, or seven, might it be none of them. So very quickly brief, have a look at the poll there. I'd be really keen to hear what, what you think about this, what, what you think might be an, the answer to this question. Which one of these is a demand side intervention? And I'm, I'm relying on Sean just to Give me a quick rundown of the results when we have them. We shouldn't wait too long, hopefully. It's just a quick question to get up, get us off and then, then get us started. All right, so we have about 50 votes coming in. And okay. we have 13% for skills development in CVET. We have 20 votes for access to finance. We have about 4% 4, 4 elimination of child labor, 13% for entrepreneurship development, 6% for provision of old age pensions, about 13% for apprenticeship schemes, and then about 22% for none of the above. Okay, thank you. So it's, it's actually interesting, quite a mixed picture. I see the about 20% if I got it right, say number two might, might be the answer, access to finance, some are talking, uh, thinking skills development, some entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship development, the others focusing on, yeah, 31% say access to finance and 24% say none of the above. Next slide, please, to give you the answer. Because I would argue it's actually none of the above. And I know that this might come across as controversial because many of you might think access to finance and giving micro grants to businesses it's a major demand side initiative. But I would argue all of these that you see there, one to six, are actually supply side interventions if, if you're talking about labor market. And often we think, or we mistake, also entrepreneurship development, access to finance as creating employment, but they are actually not necessarily stimulating demand for goods and services or demand for labor. They're supporting businesses in various forms uh, uh, of how to, to, to enable or how to act, um, uh, uh, operate in the markets. But that doesn't mean it stimulates the demand for the goods and per, uh, uh, services. So in a context where many economies are actually demand side constraints, particularly in low income countries, especially in Africa and so on, this does not actually stimulate demand. And I can go into that into more detail as we move forward, but this is quite an important premise as we move forward. Next one, please. Ah, and next, yes, thanks. So when we talk about demand and supply side, we need to differentiate a little bit. Are we talking about aggregate demand and aggregate supply, uh, which is, of course, talking about the economy as a whole, goods, uh, the, the demand for goods and services and so on, or are we talking about labor demand and supply? And this is quite an important distinction because actually some of the policies that look at stimulating aggregate supply, maybe, meaning looking at our productive capacity in an economy, uh, stimulating uh, certain sectors, raising capital investment. They are aggregate supply side measures, but they serve to stimulate labor demand. So you realize it's actually quite complicated. But to make it a bit easier, what we really should be focusing upon, that's what I propose here for this discussion, is that we actually focus firmly on labor demand and labor supply. And there we need to understand that labor demand, meaning the the demand for workers, meaning the jobs that are out there, the employment opportunities that are out there, that is not automatically derived from growth, unlike often what is often being said. Uh, in many countries, we see that, that, that there's a lot of growth happening, 
There's a lot of investment, especially in capital intensive sectors and the extractive sectors, but there's very little employment growth. So we cannot assume that, that in those type of countries, labor demand or the employment growth is derived from economic growth. What matters is the quality of growth and what matters is structural transformation. That's, that'll be a key concept that I'll go into in a minute. Next one, please. So when we talk about employment promotion, we, we need to talk about basically three basic premises, labor demand, labor supply, and then the intermediation between the two of them. By that, we need, of course, again, labor demand means the jobs that are out there, the sectors that are creating jobs for people or employment opportunities. But when we talk about employment, we talk equally about self-employment. Then on the other hand, we have labor supply, meaning the people that are looking to fill these jobs, that are wanting to sell their labor power in the market, in the labor market, so to speak, that want to uh, get a job, that want to be self-employed and so on. And here, of course, we talk about the different uh, um, demographics in the labor market. We talk about skills. We talk maybe also about the type of labor supply we don't want to see. We don't want children working, of course. We don't. We want old people to be able to enjoy a pension and so on. All these are supply side issues. But often also we see that these are not really matched, the demand and supply. And so we have also interventions between the two on the intermediation. Next, please. And all of these we can uh, tackle with various, with policy uh, responses at various areas, macroeconomic sector, labor market policies. And all of these speak in various ways how to address these. I won't go into much detail, but it's something that we need to be aware of. Next slide, please. Um, so, next one, please. So, I want to make a case why I think we need to focus more on the demand side, actually. And I would actually say that there's a huge bias in our work, uh, when, I, when we talk about development work in particular, in, in our interventions, a bias on supply side measures. We focus a lot on skills development. Uh, training. We focus a lot on, on entrepreneurship development. We give a lot of grants and access to finance interventions out to people. Uh, that's, that's, those are core business or intervention areas for development aid or development programs or projects. But very often we do not work as much on the demand side. Sure, we do value chain development, maybe market systems development, but very often they don't necessarily go to the core of the issues because they're actually quite complicated. But I would say the reason why we see poverty, underemployment, working poverty, unemployment out there is down to a very simple reason. And the simple reason is that la uh, labor demand is much lower than labor supply. There are too many people out there looking for, a job, for jobs and there are not enough jobs out there. Uh, to put that in a very simple statistic, um, over the past 15 or so years, uh, in Africa, the, the average um, employment growth was was around 1.8 percent so each year 1.8 percent more employment opportunities at the same time the labor force grew by three percent so as we go on we get more and more people surging into the labor market but the, the employment opportunities are not keeping up so what we need to do that therefore is quite simply we need to adjust rebalance the labor market we need to tighten the labor market as i could say that means we need to either reduce the labor supply, which is something that's not easy to do because it's off mostly driven by demographic change, or we need to, or end, we need to increase labor demand. We need to create productive jobs and employment opportunities out there. And those, especially in, in rural areas where a lot of those uh, unemployed or underemployed people are. So I want to go a little bit into this, how this can be achieved. Next slide, please. Now, um, I'm going to skip this one, but given that I'm from the ILO, I need to talk about decent work and, and just maybe one second and then maybe have a look at this afterwards. But when, when I talk about employment, I don't just talk about the number of jobs. I also talk just as much about the quality of jobs and these need to be promoted at the same time. But maybe at the same time, we also need to be clear that decent work is a very high, very, very aspirational ambition that we can't achieve, of course, from day one, especially in very deprived contexts. So, so this slide, just to tell you that it's a gradual process, and that doesn't mean that when we work on employment promotion, we need to achieve a decent job from day one when we do our work or when we promote employment, but that it is a gradual process, but we need to pay clear attention to the quality of work. 
Uh, next slide, please. And sorry that I need to rush a little bit for time reasons. But this slide, I want to go into a bit more detail because it's very important. I talked about structural transformation. Very often when we talk about structural transformation, I think many of you will be aware of the concept. It means changing the structure of the economy from low value added to high value added, to from low productivity to higher productivity production. It's a key concept of development that I think we all agree is fundamental to, to uh, um, um, achieving development in any country, historically and now. Now, very often we forget the labor market side of that same process, and this is what this graph is showing. On this graph, you see from the left to the right, lower, uh, uh, poorer countries to richer countries by per capita GDP. So on the very left, you see the poorest countries, on the very right, the richest countries. And, and on, the, on the vertical axis, you see the, the distribution of workers in these. And I think it's very clear that there's a clear trend in these economies, as the country grows richer, there's a huge shift in the labor force on the labor market. And that shift, of course, is the reduction in this purple area and the huge increase in the green area, whereas the others, maybe also the reduction in the red area, but, but uh, the others more or less uh, stay the same. Now, what you see here is the purple area is all agricultural workers. So as the country grows richer, we go into higher productivity production, and it means that more or less automatically, and that's something that we also see in the African context, many other countries, uh, developing countries, that people move out of agriculture in all its various forms. And where do they move? They move into this green area, which is non-agricultural wage and salary deployment. That means people are getting a paid job. They don't become micro-entrepreneurs. They don't become business owners, the majority of them, get a salary, and more and more of them as a country grows richer. This is a very natural process as a labor market gets more sophisticated, as an economy gets more sophisticated, as production gets more sophisticated. But that tells you us when we pursue development, we cannot assume that the structure of the labor market and the structure of the economy stays the same. But that also tells you we need to find different types of uh, occupations for the many people in the labor force. It also points to the need for industrial policy, for sector policies, for, for finding new sectors and stimulating new sectors where these people can find productive employment. Uh, and it means a lot of that will be more and more outside agriculture. It can be in rural areas, but it most likely will be as development progresses will be outside agriculture. Next slide, please. And next. These slides actually, and, and Sean says, I'll, I'll ask you to sl skip through them. I, I'm, I'm breaking down a little bit what uh, ILO is doing on this. I'm talking about national employment policies, our normative work behind this. Uh, and the next slide, please. That's slow to change for me. Can you go on? Yes, thank you. Uh, and here, the, you, you get a a sense of all the various work areas that we're doing in that regard. I can't go through this for, for time reasons, but I, I'd like to encourage you to look at this and later, maybe when you see the PowerPoint, so just click on that logo there on the bottom right where you'll find further information. ILO, of course, is doing a lot of work in that regard. I don't want this to be a sales pitch of what we do, so to speak, so I'll skip through this, but I, I'd like to encourage you to look further through this. Next one, please, so I can and try and close soon. And next. So with the limited time I have, and I'm trying to make a case why uh, or that the demand side is really the binding constraint in the labor markets that we usually operate in, I wanted to give you a few points as of what I think works and then the next slide, what I think does not work, which maybe the next slide is even more important. First of all, we need to understand these are complex issues and I haven't done them justice here. I didn't have the time for that, but we need to look, of course, at macroeconomic issues, sectoral issues. We need to look at market systems, value chain development, these sort of things. And we need to pay close attention to employment. We don't, it is not enough for, for us to seek business growth. It's not enough for us to see, seek economic growth. We need to look actively at employment, the number of jobs out there, the quality of the jobs out there, and only then can we make a dent into this huge issue. But this is not done by one or the other intervention. There are no silver bullets. It needs 
very comprehensive type of programs, very comprehensive type of policies. And then there are a few countries that have been able to manage this slightly more uh, successfully than others. Um, well, like I said, we, we need to, I think, throughout economic policy making, we need to have an employment focus. That means pro employment macroeconomic policies, sector policies, industrial policies, I said it before, but also the implementation of them. Do we embed employment targets in the national budgets? Probably we don't very often, but it's something that's quite necessary. And, and the success, successful examples of there, like China, South Korea, who had massive employment growth through the development history, they have done these things. They've actually paid close attention of, 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 of yeah, embedding employment targets in, in, in their uh, economic policy making. We need to incentivize employment intensive investment in, in particular sectors and those sectors that can be transformative. And by incentivizing, I, I talk beyond what we usually mean by an enabling environment. This is not enough. This needs an active role, an active uh, guidance of, of, of identifying those sectors in a particular country that we need to invest and then, then um, triggering or incentivizing that and attracting that investment. Skills development is important. Don't get me wrong. So we need to work on the supply side. Of course, in many cases, there are skills shortages, but it needs to be closely aligned with the demand. And that is something we're not doing. Very often we have, uh, we hear blanket statements that, oh, um, can I say like Africans don't have the skills and that's why they don't have employment. That is not true. I think also it's like such a statement would be slightly condescending in my view. I think there's plenty of skills out there. The question is, are they in tune with the demand? Are they, are they geared towards enabling such a, a structural transformation that I'm talking to? And often they're not, but often our skills problem are not really taking that into account. I think we need to do more there. Um, there's other issues here, but I'd like to go to the next slide. Please allow me to close, knowing that I'm going probably a bit too long. Next slide. There we are. Thanks. What does not work? And then, and I'll close with this. I, I want to put, uh, um, point your attention to the first line there. Very often, when we do employment projects, employment programs, what we are actually doing, we're not really creating jobs, but we're change what I would call changing the order of the queue. What do I mean by that? If you think about a, a skills development project that, that gives much needed skills to certain part, to your beneficiaries, what you're actually doing in most cases is not actually creating jobs, but you're giving, of course, an advantage to, to your beneficiaries to compete better in the labor market. But actually, what you do is you give them a head start. They, they move to the front of the queue to, to be more likely to receive a job in that area where they've been trained. But that means other people, of course, move back in the queue. What that means, it's a zero sum game and you haven't actually reduced unemployment, at least not the rate of unemployment that much, if you see what I mean, because you have not that, created that many jobs. Sure, some of those trained people might be job creators, but this will always be a minority. So we, we must at the same time think about how to create those jobs that then can be filled by these people that we are training. I'm not saying we shouldn't train people, but we need to think much more seriously about the, about the demand side here. And, and again, when you do your development projects, think about this. Are we actually creating jobs or are we just changing the order of the queue outside the farm gate, outside the factory gates? And very often I think it would be the, this problem. We should not just focus on easily measurable results. It, it sort of goes down the same area. Very often in our projects, we of course worry about our evaluation reports, our, our results, and those need to be measurable. But then it's much easier to count the number of trainings delivered. It's much easier to count the grants that have been provided. But to count the actual numbers of jobs, let alone the decent or productive jobs that have been created, is much more difficult and it's a much more systemic problem that is not easily measured. But I would argue that if we all work towards that one, we'd stand a much better chance of, of uh, re, um, creating a, a more sustainable or, or systemic result. And therefore, I think we need to move beyond just these measurable results and try to find ways of being a bit more open-minded to, to, to more systemic types of measurements and systemic types of changes. 
I think I have to close there, and I would encourage you to look at some of these other uh, points that I'm trying to make here. I'm aware that I don't have time for them, but I'm, I think we can also discuss more in the question and answer. I'm also very aware that I haven't talked that much about youth employment as such. This is not quite by accident, because when we talk about employment issues, these are systemic structural issues, and that needs structural solutions. And youth employment is usually a sub-problem of the wider employment problem. Problem. Of course, there are specific issues to youth uh, that we need to, to address, and then and, and some sectors are more uh, are geared towards youth, creating youth employment than others. But these are, I would almost argue, minor to the bigger problem of not enough jobs and not enough productive jobs being created in many of the economies that we're working with there. And that's why I chose to go a bit bigger picture in this regard. Uh, this is not me saying that youth aren't employment. It doesn't mean that we... Uh, we should not target youth specifically, but we will not succeed if we don't, if we are not aware of these larger comprehensive issues. Uh, let me hand over to, to Lula, and apologies if I was a bit too long, but I hope I was able to give you a bit of an insight of how our thinking is uh, on these type of issues. And thanks, I'm looking forward to the dis discussion. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where in the world you're tuning in from. For me, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be a part of this conversation today. So I thank Jane and the AgriLinks team for the invitation. And I thank you, Bernard, for setting the scene and really tackling the question of how to balance the supply side and demand side approaches for better youth employment. For my part, I think both approaches, I'm going to deviate a little bit from you, Bernard, are equally important. And so I'll use my 15 minutes to make my case. Next slide, please. All right. So um, in terms of the topic coverage, then there are three things that I'd like to do this afternoon. First, I'd like to share with the audience my context, essentially explaining my why I've chosen to join the conversation on better youth employment outcomes, after which I'll make the case for the supply side approaches geared towards empowering and equipping the youth of today. Then I'll close by advocating for the role of the agri-food sector in facilitating employment creation on the demand side. Next slide, please. All right, in terms of my context, next slide, please. For me, this question on supply and demand side approaches for better youth employment outcomes is deeply personal. I come from a large family, I'm one of eight. Um, what you're seeing here is a picture of my immediate family that was taken in 2012 at our family home in Waha in the Eastern Cape. And so when I start to think about these issues on youth employment, I see the faces of those little ones that are seated there on the ledge and it stops for me at least becoming an academic or purely academic or professional exercise, it also becomes one that's personal. Next slide, please. In fact, these issues became even more real for us as a family in 2021, when my young nephew, Daniel, who's pictured here, decided to break with a three generation long tradition of formal higher education. Right? Instead, he chose to pivot in response to a rapidly changing world and has accepted an internship where he is now works on building cost-effective, sustainable, and chemically-free aquaponic systems across South Africa. Next slide, please. And in preparing for this talk, I realized that Daniel's journey, it's not unique to him. When I read headlines like these from the Wall Street Journal article, it strikes me that this is an emerging global conversation that COVID and its associated lockdown has fast-tracked over these past two years. Next slide, please. And so in short, this next generation has basically, in my opinion, inherited what I consider a fragile system that's showing its cracks and they will have to pivot and carve out pathways that make sense to them. And it's our jobs as families, as educators, as professionals to adapt to their pivots. So that's on my side of the personal context. Next slide, please. 
at a professional level, this conversation is equally important and of interest to me. One of my many roles I am, that I play is that I have the privilege of serving as a technical chair for to an amazing network of African-based uh, agricultural policy research institutes known as RENAPRI. Next slide, please. Now, this network consists of 11 nationally uh, national agriculture policy research think tanks that are spread across Eastern and Southern and West Africa. We formed this network in 2012 for the express purpose of collaborating on research, data sharing, and most importantly, capacity development. And for us as a network, we take that third objective seriously. And so as a network, we've committed to building local capacity, and we do this by forming formal links with national universities. And at some level, this is self-serving for the network because what this does is it creates a pipeline of young talent over time. And over time, what we've done is built a stock of well-placed former students who are able to open doors to relevant stakeholders, both in the private as well as the public sector. So that's my context on a personal and a professional level. Now to the question at hand. Next slide, please. In the lead up to this event as a panelist, we were asked to think through how to balance supply and demand side approaches to deliver better youth outcome, employment outcomes. And as I said in my opening, I believe both approaches deserve equal attention. And I'll explain why and how, starting on the supply side. Next slide, please. Now, in 2019, I was invited to a policy roundtable on right-skilling the workforce in Africa for Industry 4.0, organized and hosted by the African Center for Economic Transformation or ASSET. Next slide, please. Now, in this meeting, they dropped two statistics that were really eye-opening for me. The first was from the World Economic Forum 2016 Future of Jobs report that estimated 65% of primary aged children will enter jobs that currently don't exist. The other stat was from a report authored by the Institute for, Future, for the Future, published by Dell. And in this report, they were estimate that 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 have yet to be invented. I tell you the truth, the not, those, these numbers had me and other uh, participants sitting up in our seats. Next slide, please. Right, and if that wasn't enough, dropping those stats on us, the organizers then challenged us in our own capacities to identify what skills would be required for the future workforce. And based off of that list, then outline concrete actions that government, industry, and academia could undertake to build the right skills for the fourth industrial revolution. Right now, given my sphere of influence, I can or could only really speak to what academia and government could do. And today, three years later, I would like to share what I proposed and continue to propose in that regard. Next slide, please. Starting on the academic side, a second hat that I wear is that of a lecturer at Stellenbosch University. And to be perfectly frank, the notion that I have that responsibility to equip my students for jobs I can't even imagine, while on the one hand, it can be exciting, it can also be rather overwhelming. Next slide, please. All right. And so in a sense, as an educator, I'm being called on to be a great hockey player that doesn't just play where the puck is, but skates to where the puck is going. And to quote Wayne Gretzky for the American audiences out there. So the question then becomes, as an educator, where do I focus and how do I do this? Next slide, please. Well, in 2019, this was the list I developed for assets, and this is the list that I shared with my department. And in my opinion, as a university, as a department, as an educator, if we are to effectively equip the next generation for jobs that are yet to exist, we need to recognize that STEM subjects will remain important. But equally important is to develop our students' 
uh, business leadership, entrepreneurial, and here's a new one, social influencing skills. Uh, how do you do that, right? As well as critical thinking and complex problem solving skills. And finally, we need to also build their ability to effectively collaborate with each other. Over the past three, three years, I and our department have been working actively to adapt our curriculum and classrooms to incorporate these elements to name but a few. So on that, so that's on the academic side. Next slide, please. What about African governments? What should African governments do right um, to do the right skills, um, do to right skill the next generation? Well, there are many things that they can do, and I know Bernard, in your 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 um, in your uh, talk, you pointed out some of these in your presentation. But if I were to really narrow it on the focus to a single message to African policymakers, I would recommend. Next slide, please. Increasing our public investments in agriculture R, D, and E by achieving the 1% target of agricultural GDP invested. Now, I know this is not a new message, but it's a drum that I've been beating since the launch of AGRA's African Agricultural Status Report 2021, a few weeks back. And to nuance this message, I would further recommend that R and D spending should not just focus at the primary agricultural level, but also should go beyond the farm gate. Now, why do I say that? Next slide, please. Well, why do I say this? Well, while I was working on the African Agricultural Status Report, I happened to look at the number of patents registered in Africa by Africans over the past two decades, as shown in this table. And what I noted was that the number of patents registered for technologies most relevant at the primary agriculture level, those shaded in green, their numbers rose between the two decades, right? While technologies most relevant to downstream stages of the food system, such as handling, transportation, et cetera, that the number of patents declined over those two decades. So while, so as authors, what we concluded was, yes, let's increase public R&D spending in agriculture, but also let's go beyond just the farm gate. So that's on the supply side approach. We're faced with the challenge and for universities and for governments, there are some concrete actions that we can take to achieve better youth employment outcomes going forward. Next slide, please. Now to the demand side, right? In the lead up to this event, we had uh, our dry run session. And in the session, the point was raised on the role of agriculture in this conversation around youth employment. And while I agree that as African economies undergo structural transformation as burden, Barnum um, suggested, we can expect agriculture, primary agriculture to shed jobs, definitely. That's the expectation going forward. But the reality is that agriculture is a part of an entire food system. And in my opinion, and yes, it's biased slightly, uh, the agri-food sector definitely has a role to play in achieving better youth employment outcomes. Now, why do I say this? Well, next slide, please. At a global level, next slide, please. The agri-food system is not an insignificant sector. According to Martin Van Newkoop uh, of the World Bank, he estimates the value of global food system to be roughly 8 trillion US dollars or 10% of the 80 trillion uh, global economy. As a sector, Right? It offers a range of employment opportunities from soil scientists, plant pathologists, all the way to fund managers and food marketers. Right? And for the youth, it also provides an opportunity to make a difference. And, and, and in my engagements with students, et cetera, I'm finding they're, they're passionate about making their mark on this world. Right? The sector is faced with a number of challenges and our, our young people have the opportunity to make a difference. Right? In terms of the, the challenges that the sector faces, we're faced with issues of malnutrition on the one hand and obesity and unhealthy diets on the other. There's also high degrees of food wastage and we're faced with serious natural, um, natural resource constraints. And all of this then indicates that the system needs to be transformed, 
right? And this is a message that came clear out clearly from the UN Food Systems Summit that ha happened just last week, right? And so the current structure of the food system really needs to be transformed. And I think this sector then offers these students an opportunity to really make a difference, to really move us in the direction of transformation, right? But let's talk about Africa. I'm speaking at a global level, but let's talk about Africa. Next slide, please. For Africa, as uh, Bernard pointed out, we really are faced with this added challenge of persistent informality. Um, as we pointed out in the African Agricultural Status Report, the majority of marketed food output in Africa goes beyond, uh, goes through undercapitalized informal markets. For example, our grains and tubers and pulses move through those markets. The vast majority of those employed in these food systems are living or living near or below the poverty line. And this applies not only to the primary agricultural level, but in the off stage of farm stages of the food system. Next slide, please. And in the ASSR, what we recognized was that the role, there is a role for the formalized agri-food system to offer employment opportunities you just have to simply look at the numbers. Next slide, please. Right, in the ASSR report, what we did was we tracked the employment numbers for uh, numbers of South Africa's three largest retailers from 2015 to 2020. And the two things that leapt out at us was that number one, the sheer number of employed, over 45,000 of mass smart um, people, 40, over 45,000 people are uh, employed by mass smart, 53,000, 50, 50, 53, 53, over 53,000 for pick and pay, while ShopRite employed over 145,000 people. But mass, uh, but for, and then the second thing that lived out as us over these two, these five year periods, right, but, all, but for mass mart, employment numbers rose over the past five years. But this just isn't happening at the retail level. Next slide, please. It's happening also at the processing level as well. So in this ASSR report, when we looked at random sampling of five of the top 100 food, beverage, and milling companies in Africa, as listed by the Food Business Africa in 2020, uh, we note that these companies are, employ a significant number of people. And through their commitments to sourcing locally, as well as social corporate responsibility programs, they have they really are leading this charge in building sustainable and resilient food systems on the continent. Next slide, please. So to conclude then, for Africa, the formalized agri-food system has a role to play in facilitating employment creation, thereby transforming our economies and our food systems. Right? But to do this, next slide, please will require African policymakers creating an enabling environment that facilitates increased private sector investments in the right sectors, as Bernard noted. And equally important is to ensure a level playing field and healthy competition through effective regulation of the sector. Next slide, please. So, to end then, this conversation is for me extremely important, both personally and professionally. So again, I thank Jane and the AgriLinks for the invitation. In my opinion, both supply and demand side approaches are equally important. On the supply side, the objective really is to empower the youth. On the demand side, there's definitely a role for the agri-food sector. So with that then, I'd like to thank you and hand it over to Tracy. Tracy, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I hope you can all hear me. And I am more than happy to participate in this event. Um, and I'll make my presentation short, I promise. As mentioned, my name is Tracy Kimathi. I'm the founder of Baridi, a solar powered cold room innovation targeted at East Africa's livestock value chain. And as a startup entrepreneur, I believe my points in the discussion will be based on how smaller companies approach youth employment and the ironic benefits that drive young millennials and Generation Zs to startups rather than larger, more stable businesses. 
as I mentioned previously, the role of micro and small enterprises in the job markets cannot be ignored. In Kenya alone, approximately 80% of jobs created are done so by companies like mine, companies that work on a project by project basis and require a more contractual and informal staff rather than full-time employees. Next slide, please. So let's start with the supply end, again, taking Kenya as an example. There are 500,000 youths who graduate from various tertiary institutions yearly, ready to enter the job market. This means that, technically speaking, there is a surplus amount of incredibly brilliant and energetically trained African youths looking for jobs. And quite frankly, I don't think there's a shortage of expertise supply rather than a shortage of demand from industry players. To show you an example of how competitively skilled the African job market is, I'll share a story of how earlier this year during our first launch, a Japan-based company approached my startup with an aim to outsource our technical team only to fall short in a basic electrical design concept that our current engineer Chesebe, who is an African, completed in a faster and more efficient work manner. So again, I insist, supply of qualified, smart, and enabled Africans is not the problem of the job market, rather than the demand to absorb them into industries. Next slide, please. Another way of looking at encouraging young employees to hire each other is to enable the supply side to be the demand. I believe most, if not all, formal employees have considered getting a quote-unquote side hustle that acts as a secondary stream of income. Highly skilled employees who know how to maneuver across the business world are very likely to pursue part-time business ventures of their own and hire informal employees as well. This double-edged sword where a worker can also be an employee is very underrated, but really does shed some light on how majority middle income earners actually contribute to the job market themselves. Next slide, please. Which immediately brings us to the pains on the demand side. Remember how I mentioned that SMEs absorb 80% of the total job populations? Well, the truth is most of these employees are informal. And this is simply because most startups don't necessarily have a large six-figure budget allocated to salaried staff. Startups have a need for trained youths, but salary points might not match. This pain, however, has a pretty efficient solution. During the pandemic, sorry, my company decided to try and salvage our monthly burn rate by changing all our employees' status, including my own, to contractual employment, meaning staff would get paid based on hourly rates rather than monthly salaries. What this unraveled was phenomenal. Productivity improved due to the fact that we were able to onboard highly skilled staff who are driven by the aspect of work flexibility. All we needed was a seven hour work week and we could pay a part-time CFO level staff the same annual allowance as a full-time recently graduated intern. What's even better is that these individuals were pretty happy with their arrangement because what a young person wants more than anything, perhaps even more than money, is the freedom to control their work days. This gives them the privilege to spend time with family, friends, and their own selves, a perfect win-win scenario to the demand supply perspective. Now, our company solely works with contractual based skill on a project by project basis, and the productivity as well as our monthly burn rates have never looked better. Next slide, please. 
Another demand solution that helps onboard qualified employees to your impact metrics is the art of partnership. A lot of African startups tend to record a significantly large job employment rate, and this is due to B2B collaborations. For example, in our recently launched solar chiller units, we partnered with six different local companies. If we were to aggregate all of their employees, they would total to 50 paid formal skilled workers who are employed over a period of three months. So we shouldn't really look at employment as full-time staff. Otherwise, a large sector would be missed out. Instead of a larger company hiring five people in their solar department team, why not collaborate with an existing local SME that will enable employment to their 20 to 30 staff members on your project? Collaboration between able larger companies with smaller skilled companies is definitely an employment driver that needs to be emphasized on. Next slide, please. Now, let's look at impact and why more youths are placing impact gratification at workplaces as one of their top rankings for what they would prefer as a career. I started today's conversation by stating the irony that young millennials and Gen Zs are more driven to work at startups rather than larger, more stable businesses. And we really need to understand what drives a young person to employment. With these two age groups being the largest ones in the job markets, especially in Africa, employers need to understand how to efficiently onboard them into their workplaces. Unlike previous generation, millennials and Gen Zs are not necessarily in it for the money, they are more independent with their thought processes and are more eager to learn and build their skill for the sole reason of making an impact. They know technology, they don't waste time, they're not blindly loyal to a company, and if you want your organization to be the creme de la creme, then you need to convince them to be on your team. So the real question on impact is, how are employers helping young job seekers to actively make an impact? Why would a young person work for a coal industry if they can innovate for solar? These are genuine questions that extremely qualified job seekers consider when they have both offers on the table. Other than global impact, one of the greatest gifts employment has to a young person is offering them a chance to contribute positively to their communities. They can buy food for their families and act as providers. They can pay household electricity, rent, school fees, and contribute financially towards their community's betterment. And that means a lot to a young person. Next slide, please. So as you've heard from both Dr. Mueller and Lulama, youth employment is not even a topic to dispute. And my final points will emphasize on how we as young people can employ ourselves by creating businesses that offer impact-driven solutions and allow us to reshape the notion of an eight to five employment perspective to a freelance work environment, which enables healthy time management for ourselves and the people around us. I live in a continent where young people are being forced to take over business roles due to a lack of employment opportunities. Basically, you start a business because there are no jobs. And that's really how employment is created in Sub-Sahara. That's how it was created back in the Industrial Revolution days, and that's how it will definitely be created in the future. We as young people need to take things into our own hands very, very early on. And we see these gaps in the employment sector, and we should probably be the ones to fill them in. So let's fill them in. Starting a business is definitely not easy. Trust me, 
I have done it. I am doing it. It's not easy, especially in the developing countries that need them the most. However, the job employment rate ripples with the growth of new businesses. And as I mentioned, the paradox between an employer who pays and an employee who hires might just be the answer to a secure job field future to young people. So thank you for listening in, and I hope you've learned a bit from my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of our speakers. We really appreciate the, the presentations, and uh, thank you to our audience for all the uh, great questions that are coming in to the uh, Q&A section. Um, I will start with um, asking some of those questions. Some of our speakers have gone in and uh, answered your questions, so be sure to go back in and check to see which ones uh, might or might not be answered for you. Uh, with that, I will start off with um, a question from Matthias uh, Lasego Hare. Uh, in Eastern Europe, we realize that the issue is not so much supply or demand, the real problem is bringing the two together, i.e. channeling A sometimes jumps around, uh, i.e. channeling workforce into the right economic sectors that have future potential making sure people have the information they need to, to make informed choices. Um, any comment um, from, I think, Bernd? I think that was from your section of this the talk. If you're able so, uh, to yeah, come off mute. <clears throat> can you see me? Yes. Or hear me better. <laughs> it's good that you can see me. I hope you can also hear me. That's more important. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I, it depends very much on the context of the labor market. Uh, I think a lot of the labor markets in Eastern Europe are probably much more advanced and sophisticated, maybe compared to many of the labor markets that we often work in Africa, for example, or other low income countries. So, and, and, and the challenges are different. So we have established industries in, in Eastern Europe. We have uh established sectors that are probably a bit more sophisticated than a lot of the production of the economies in africa unfortunately uh, and there w the the challenges are quite different in matching the youth to those existing industries or maybe also readjusting the the econ economic base to 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 change the needs of uh, a youth coming into the labor market and there we need public employment services we need placement services and so on uh, that's quite vital so there the if you remember my slides with the three layers labor demand supply and then intermediation in the middle there the intermediation becomes much more important i would argue in africa it's a bit less so um yeah i i wanted to to get onto one i love tracy's uh, presentation so thanks for that i, I thought that was great uh, i just wanted to very briefly get onto that in the sense that we need to make sure and and she's very right in, in what she presented in, 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 in terms of the, the vibrancy and the dynamics of the, the African labor force. And I think it's something we underestimate. Often we talk about the low skills and how, how Africans are not skilled. And I, I don't like those arguments. I mean, frankly, if you put me into any, any setting of a smallholder farm and then ask me to survive, I wouldn't, I would perish within, within, within a few days. So to say they don't have skills, it's quite condescending. And, and, and even the others who are coming out of the education system. But the point is that we don't just need to focus on the one end or the other. And, and the spectrum is quite wide and we need to find those type of jobs and, and, and they need to stimulate that type of employment that is suited for the labor force. And that very often means actually, of course, finding the jobs for, for, for those that come out of the education system, but also those who don't have that opportunity. And that means looking much more into manual occupations, manual sectors, maybe manufacturing, quite basic occupations and there's nothing work, worth bad with that there can be decent jobs in a factory of course and in 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 in, in, in a very uh, basic type of occupation and that's the type of things that we need to look at and i think very often we might be forgetting that thank you um so for a question uh this comes from anonymous and i think could apply to all members all speakers um, should the youth 
in employment programs be seen as a program goal or as a lens for inclusion within employment interventions? Any thoughts from any of our speakers on that? No? Okay. Sorry, uh, well, I you could, but, but, the question? Uh, exactly. exactly. Let the other Sorry, the, the question is, uh, should youth in employment programs be seen as a program goal or a lens for inclusion, inclusion within employment interventions? I would it think be it could be a goal be, itself or a lens. Could it be both, both the goal and the lens? I, I leave it to you, <laughs> your, your personal <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> Personally, I think it could be both, right? The goal is to, to bring them in, but it's also a, a lens through which we could allow for inclusive transformation going forward. That's my opinion. Thank you. Um, other of, of our speakers, uh, Tracy or Bernard? Um, yeah, I think it should be a necessity. Um, especially in Africa, you have no choice but to include youths because most of the people are youths. You go to a doctor, there it's a youth doctor. You go to a, you know, a start a enterprise, it's a person like me. So it's not even a, a matter for me. It's 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 a must to include youths. You don't have an option but to do that. I don't know if that answers it, but it really there's no option because majority of the population is youth. Thank you. If no other questions, I've got uh, another question. So uh, Adebe, Adebabe, uh, access to finance to start a business is a major bottleneck as banks and MFIs require collateral. How it, how is it, how can this be solved? Are there, do you have any suggestions? This is a question for Tracy, though others uh, of, the, of the speakers can um, answer on this too. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It's very hard um, to get banks to invest in you, especially when you're a young person with very little collateral. Um, I think a lot of grant-based financing is emerging in the in the industry. As long as you have a you know net positive climate solution, you can maybe try a lot of grant-based uh, solutions. Once you grow a little bit more, you can go into equity. Um, for me, um, I get what you're saying. Uh, banks don't uh, necessarily offer a lot of young people um, enough capital to start their businesses. And usually, by the way, uh, your first business. Uh, almost always fails. So maybe it's not even a good idea to go into the debt, you know, uh, facilities at, at your first try. So I would say try grant-based financing, especially in Africa. And if you have a, an impact positive solution or business model, maybe that would help a little bit um, or competition um, facilities. Again, I, I know it might seem like it's a, it's a rat race, but th that is really your only option especially when you're starting out a business that might fail. Um, sorry to say, but it's probably true that, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Tracy. Um, our next question comes from uh, Claudia Velasco. Um, involve involvement of policymakers has been a potential solution by many, or a proposed solution by many, but actually how do you really engage policy maker, makers? How can we successfully make sure youth employment is tackled on different state tables whilst employment in a broad in broad terms is still a current problem? Thoughts on how to engage yeah. policymakers? Yeah, I guess that one that one goes in my direction a little bit. Just to speak a little bit more to the policy side. <laughs> Look, I wish I had an easy answer to that because clearly that is that is one of the, the areas that we're struggling with. Um, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, or that, that I have been talking about maybe specifically, is, is, is it requires a lot of political vision, a lot of political will, 
um, a very dedicated strategy. Uh, and, and those things, unfortunately, have been uh, have been few and far between. So, but but I think that's where our advocacy role comes in. That's where our uh, role in supporting policy processes comes in. And and I that is my main day job, so to speak, trying to improve policy processes in all the various countries in in Africa that I work in. And it can be incredibly frustrating. It certainly isn't something that 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 uh, speaks to quick solutions, quick gains, quick results. Uh, but but I think it's absolutely indispensable. If we don't do that, if we don't find ways of of continuously uh, uh, exploring that narrative, seeking out that dialogue, of finding new ways of of shaping the economies, particularly in the African context, if that isn't happening, and if we keep on pandering to these old recipes and, 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 and leaving it to basically the youth having to figure it out themselves, which I think is incredibly unfair through, through encouraging to, to be entrepreneurs, encouraging to be self-employed, all that extremely valiant, what Tracy's talking about is extremely uh, um, commendable. I have the biggest respect for that. I could never do that myself, but I think it's so unfair for those many people who don't have that option, who don't really have that entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit, who, who don't really have the means to start their own businesses, at least not really viable businesses. And for those, we need different types of solutions, and all, that can only happen through policy. Uh, it is a bit frustrating, but I think it's, it's again, something where, where all of us in the, if I can say, development sector or the uh, for-purpose sector, as it's sometimes called, need to come together and, 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 and then try and drive that change. Otherwise, it will never be sustainable in the first place. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, any thoughts from Tracy and Lulama on engagement with uh, policymakers? Uh, from my side, I mean, this is one of those hats I wear as well, engaging with policymakers. And what we're finding as national institutes it's really, it's a time consuming effort and it's one in which we can't give up having the conversations with them or keep, you know, narrowing down the focus to more feasible, implementable, you know, recommendations around certain issues. And so, like I said, you know, for for me right now, I'm really pushing this notion of invet public investments in rd and &E, And that's the one single message I will bring to them um, in order to allow them to focus on, on a single, you know, deliverable going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tracy, any comment? Um, yeah, so with engaging with policies, I think um, for me, joining programs like uh, UNEP programs, for example, like I'm in a UNEP program called AWIF, which is the African Women's energy entrepreneurs framework. Uh, so they are definitely frameworks and programs, uh, maybe not from governments, but from uh, larger uh, global organizations like uh, the UN, that you can kind of go in and then you can also give advice to what you think the policy should be made. Now, right now, I, I know we have the COP26 going on and they're really calling on to youths to suggest what policies they think, you know, would work um, in a global perspective. So I do think youth can can affect policies. You just have to join these global organizations and you have to time them on this, you know, really uh, big um, summits. And then they really need to, they, they welcome uh, youth voices. Uh, whether they implement them or not is a question of another day. But at least, you know, we can voice our opinion and say this is what policy I, I think needs to be implemented in the agriculture sector, in the renewable energy sector. They'll listen to it. Uh, they'll draft a policy on it. But we really do need to work on the implementation uh, stages. I agree with what they said. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so... A question kind of on the, the kind of next part of of places to focus, you know, what is the role, this comes from uh, Misei uh, Yami, 
uh, what is the role of private sector in, cre in creating inclusive and decent employment opportunities for an unemployed, unemployed youth in Africa and as well as elsewhere? You know, within the agricultural sector, there are important subsectors that could create more jobs like horticulture and poultry. Yeah, sorry, can I take this? Um, sure. So with with private sector, especially in agriculture, there was this video that was going around uh, of people saying, let's make agriculture sexy so that the youths can be employed into it. So I think what private companies can do is definitely advertise better um, so and encourage better as well. So the private sector, of course, is the biggest um, driver of employment to youths in not only in Africa, but globally. So of course they do have a role in that. Their role is to employ, but to enable a youth to go into the agriculture sector, maybe um, the way they advertise uh, agriculture would be a better way of looking at it. So if private sectors can uh, make agriculture sexy, excuse my Swahili, I think that would be a very good factor that will bring youths into that sector. But generally, the private sector is the biggest driver of employment, no doubt, um, and their existent, existence in itself um, you know, encourages uh, youth employment. Thank you, Tracy. I note, uh, Lulama, you also had provided an answer actually in the Q&A chat. Do you want to follow up on that? No, definitely. Um, one of the things I was saying, and I agree with the question, yes, there are definite sectors that are labor intensive. And if, again, you know, you're talking from a policy side, you know, creating those enabling environments that are, are sector relevant or sector specific. Um, and so we need to think through, okay, what are the sectors which are labor intensive that can generate the employment that we need? What are the investments that need to happen in order to, to see increased um, in private sector investments or playing in that, those spaces going forward? So definitely that. And I also wanna just also add to what Tracy had said earlier about you know making agricultural sexy. One of the things that we're also talking about, well, at least in the circles that I'm running in, is that it, it goes beyond just making it sexy, we need to make it profitable for the young people, you know? And so if, if it's not profitable, they're not gonna get into it. And so what do we do? What, what do we need to put into place to make it profitable? Those are some questions we would need to wrestle with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this comes from uh, Anonymous and it's directed to Tracy. From your experience, what key sectors industry should be the key sectors to attract youth uh, in Africa? And this is kind of a, on a similar theme. Others have been asking uh, questions around what sectors to focus on, whether in a particular country uh, such as Nigeria or elsewhere. Um, does it vary by location or you know, are there some key sectors for which we can focus on? Over. Yeah, um, good question. So Dr. Mueller, I think, uh, said something about that, and it's almost obvious that it's agriculture. Um, I'm very attracted to renewable energy as well, but that's a biased answer. But I think I think agriculture agriculture really needs um, to employ more youths. And you know, right now the, the the jobs available to youths in the agriculture sector. Is, is very, uh, how is this? it's a uh, manual. Um, so you hire youth to dig. You don't hire youth to, you know, get a tractor to innovate, you know? So I think the agriculture sector, like all of our panelists said, is probably one of the largest uh, youth employment sectors possible. But like um, Lulema, Lulema said, it has to be profitable. And you can't make it a manual thing. You can't tell somebody, just I'll employ you to dig a hole. You know, make it uh, innovative a little bit. But I think that is definitely the largest agriculture. It's no doubt, hands down, the largest sector that can employ the youths, just because we are we're a large population. We are, I think, 1.2 billion Africans. We need to be fed by ourselves. Um, so again, agriculture, but we need to make it profitable and we definitely need to make it more innovative to attract the youth. Yeah, thank you. 
Maybe. Can I come in here briefly on that? Sure, please. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Tracy, Tracy hits on a, an important point there. And I mean, I, I happen to know the, the East African context quite a bit, and then to dig out my, my little bit of Swahili as well. Um, there's, a, there's a term in Tanzania, and it's called Kufanya Kibarua. And it basically means to, do, to be a day laborer. But it's actually, it, 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 it means you dig in your neighbor's garden, you dig for a little bit of money to survive. So that's a casual worker who works in agriculture, Kufanya Kibarua. It is something, that term actually, comes back from the colonial period. It is extremely uh, derogative. It's actually almost an insult to call someone a kibaru. And that tells you something about the working conditions that we're talking about. So to say that youth are not agriculture, uh, sorry, youth are not attracted to agriculture, you have to say, yeah, well, yeah, of course they're not because the conditions are incredibly hard and appalling. And no one, no one in their right mind, none of us would ever readily say, yeah, that's something I want to do. So it, we really need to think much more structurally about how do we actually increase the productivity in the, the, these sectors? How do we increase the quality of these jobs there? But there's structural issues why the jobs are so bad, and in, in especially in small uh, agriculture, because the productivity is so low. Those are the areas where we see the deepest poverty at the end of the day. And that tells you we need it is quite unlikely that we will be able to support agriculture, certainly in the form that it is now, without heavily commercializing it, without heavily changing its structure, raising the productivity level, uh, productivity levels. But at the same time, that will mean that, let's say, on a given hectare of area, we will not be able to sustain as many workers. I mean, the the, the labor per hectare ratio will go down drastically if we do that automatically. And at the end of the day, I come back to my original, what I was saying originally, we need to look at other areas. So what about, what are we doing with that product? How do we process the, the produce? How do we do agro-processing? How do we think about value chains where other opportunities will exist? But then what are the, what are the bottlenecks for investment in those areas? Why is that investment not happening? And there we go back to the policy issues. We need to create those incentives. And in the chat, I gave the example of Ethiopia and the flower sector there. Uh, it's a controversial example because also there, there we have issues with, with the environmental impact and the, the working conditions. But at the end of the day, that's a sector that didn't exist a few years ago. And only through very dedicated state action were we able to nurture the sector, attract private sector investment, and, 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 and very quickly grow a sector that employs quite a lot of people, especially women. Um, there's problems with that, and I would need to go into more detail there. But these are the sort of in, in, uh, solutions of looking at new sectors that have a chance, that are labor intensive, and, and finding ways of attracting investment there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so on kind of talking about the, you know, engagement between, uh, you know, kind of policy and, the, and talking about private sector as well, uh, we have a, a question from Markendi. Um, sorry, I can't see your full name because it won't print it out uh, on the question. But how do you? Th what do you think is the best way to create synergies between private and public institutions to facilitate youth inclusion in entrepreneurship? Any of our speakers. Not. Uh... Can I come in on that one? Sorry, I was just sure, feeling back and thinking that. Wow, that's a it's a good question. Um, in some of the work that or the research that I'm looking at, when I'm trying to unpack, you know, different, you know, track the emergence of African-based agribusinesses, one of the things I found was a company in Rwanda that is a public-private partnership. Uh, between private sector and government. Um, also, here in South Africa, we have a number of initiatives, uh, like a Timbali incubator, which is a public-private partnership. So maybe using a, a framework of a PPP might be a way in which you can build synergies between governments and the private sector. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. 
uh, Lulama. Uh, anyone else? If not, I'll go for another question. Uh, so this comes from uh, Gabriel uh, Zamar Radi uh, Kavuli, uh, who asks, you know, sort of in a similar vein, what strategy to do uh, our speakers recommend to apply for collaboration between large companies and small companies operating in the same sector, so as not to generate conflict of interest when it comes to uh, just the work and youth employment. Uh, yeah, I'll take that because I mentioned that um, as well in my presentation. I think that's that's. I think it's really cool if larger companies and smaller companies learn how to work together rather than larger companies seeing startups as competitors. Uh, you can do a lot. So for me, I, I think uh, collaborating on projects. So like I said, instead of a larger company hiring, uh, you know, a solar department with uh, probably five. Um, team members, why not just collaborate with a smaller company that has about 10 to 20 young employees? So I think um, whilst I think that that question or ra rather that collaboration works well with projects where, uh, OK, this large company needs to set up, you know, this large agricultural project instead of them, you know, creating a whole department and then um, employing new people, uh, giving out new resources into that department, why don't you just collaborate with a local SME or a local startup that will then help you with their uh, knowledge, their expertise and their skills and their um, employees, and then they will carry out that project for you. So I think that question is really good and it's also one of the ways that uh, employment can definitely be created. Uh, how larger companies can support smaller companies to create employment and how larger companies can also stop seeing smaller startups as competition, but as collaborators. So I think that's a good question and I hope uh, my answer suits the... Um... And Tr Tracy, just to, if you don't mind, if I could follow up on Tracy. I sure, think... sure. It's great on the private sector side to think about that. There's also the a policy side that could help in this equation. And I know here in South Africa, we have a competition commission and what they do is they basically regulate, um, you know, the mergers and acquisitions that happen within in the, the, the country. And so the FDI is coming in with for mergers and acquisitions. Part of our competition policies and regulations is that these bigger companies are then need to work with, as part of the agreement, work with local small SMEs as sourcing materials or, or, or supply, input suppliers, et cetera. So through effective policies, and that's what I had mentioned in my presentation, you know, through an effective regulatory environment that really kind of, you know, levels the playing field and, and, and facilitates healthy competition in the system can allow for that synergy between the large and the small companies. Thanks. Maybe also briefly from my side, I think probably we need to wrap up brief soon, but I think quite often we talk about this 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 contrast between large and small countries and often maybe maybe larger companies get a bit of a bad stick they, they they get a bit of a bad reputation whereas i feel we need to understand that that they have an important or they have an important role to play and they can be huge drivers for employment of course and very often we see that the employment conditions in the bigger companies are actually usually quite a lot better or for many structure for many reasons such as uh, they're more visible. They they have to abide by labor regulations much more regularly than smaller informal companies. They they usually have bigger levels, or higher levels of unionization in, in the workforce, and these sort of things. So better, there's a better chance for the workforce to 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 fight for better working conditions. So, so I think there's something to be said for employment being created in larger companies. Now here I'm not just talking about massive corporations. I'm also talking about medium-sized. Uh, companies that that maybe hire up to 50 and more people so to speak but those can be quite large in some context the so it's not just an issue of competition between large and small it's also about how do we find how do we enable what i would call sustainable enterprise those that are actually viable of growing 
and growing into larger and larger employers and better and better employers? How do we create that environment? How do you nurture those type of companies? Uh, and, and at the same time, of course, we need to. Uh, and then, and, and Lula was Lula was talking about the the, the issue of the uh, uh, regulatory framework. We need to make sure that we, of course, don't have too much concentration in the sector, that we don't have unfair com uh, competition, that that of course doesn't give a chance to smaller companies. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think there's a role for both here. Excellent. So. I would like to thank our speakers once again for their great presentation, the, the dynamic uh, Q&A uh, at the end of the session, and also thank our audience for your participation, your insights that you've provided, the questions you've asked, and also the resources that you've shared. So just to let folks know that this uh, presentation has been recorded. Uh, we will post it on AgriLinks along with the slides, the transcript, uh, the Q&A, the chat box, all those sorts of resources will be on the uh, AgriLink site. Uh, you will also be getting, if you register for the event, you'll get a follow-up email that has links to all of the resources that I mentioned. Really appreciate your, you know, participating. Uh, also would like to highlight that we um, look forward to your feedback. Um, there is a post-event survey link uh, in the chat. Uh, if you could please take a moment to fill out the survey. We appreciate your feedback. It helps us to improve upon events uh, and you know, give us ideas for new theme months. And with that, thinking about the new theme month, uh, coming up rapidly is October. And for uh, our October theme month, it is going to be Earth Observations Climate Edition. So uh, if you have uh, an organization that uh, is working on Earth observations from a climate change lens uh, for ag and food security. Um, please take a look at the theme month coming up or recommend a post uh, for that theme month. So we agree, greatly appreciate uh, your contributions to those uh, theme months. Uh, with that, uh, I thank you all for you taking the time to join us uh, and uh, engage in this conversation and wish you a good rest of your day with whatever point you happen to be at in it. Uh, thank you all. <laughs>